He's a character created in the 1930s, a heroic adventurer who rights, wrongs, and punishes evildoers. Well, that narrows it down to about 600 potentials. I've heard a great deal about you. Scientist, explorer, inventor, criminologist. Well, we're still not really getting there, are we? Give up? Have no fear, the man of bronze is here. It's Doc Savage, Man of Bronze. Let us do right to all, and wrong no man. Doc Savage is a character first seen in pulp magazines of the 1930s, created by publisher Henry Ralston, editor John Anovic, and main writer Lester Dent. You may call me Doc. Doc Savage would eventually cross over into comics, a radio series, and eventually this feature film in the mid-70s. <laughs> There had been attempts to turn it into a live action project. There was one attempt for a TV series in the 60s that would have starred Chuck Connors, but nothing eventuated, partly due to a complicated situation over the rights to the character. Look, we've all been there. Due to a poker game going south, Auntie Beryl has lost the literary rights to her right leg, which means while she can theoretically write about photography or board games, she can't write about hiking or cycling for the next 10 years. Meanwhile, in the late 60s and early 70s, the Doc Savage books were still selling in huge numbers. Veteran producer George Powell finally managed to negotiate the rights to make films based on the character, hoping to launch a franchise if the first film was successful. He hired Michael Anderson, no stranger to films with a decent scale, to direct a Doc Savage movie. Coincidentally, Powell had, in the late 60s, attempted to get together a Logan's Run movie adaptation, but that would eventually be put together by other producers, with Michael Anderson directing a film released in 1976. Just a note, Doc Savage is not literally a man of bronze. I mean, he has quite the tan, sure. He also drives a bronze car and flies in a bronze aeroplane. But that's it, lest you think he's some kind of pervy bronze fetishist. In fact, I rather expected it. I, on the other hand, think nothing of mixing 85% copper with 15% tin. It's my own special blend, stam fine bronze. I mean, it hasn't sold all that well, possibly due to the marketing tagline. Eh, it's not so conductive. By the mid-70s, there was always a question of whether you updated something set in contemporary times, or left it as a period piece, complete with the speech patterns of the era. You sure you're all right? Oh, super credophilus. Doc Savage characters speak in a unique way that wouldn't necessarily roll off the tongue. Jubitable phenomenosity. But producer George Powell felt it suited the nature of the characters. Holy cow. What a plum dingy yacht this is. Powell's script took elements from a novel, Man of Bronze, as well as other Doc Savage books. The film that was released was always meant to be a G-rated film and intended as a family-friendly adventure. Who will make crime disappear? Doc Savage. Doc Savage. It's 1936. Doc Savage, also known as Clark Savage Jr., is a guy who can turn his hand to practically anything and succeed, which is exactly like my mate Dickhead Dave, apart from the bit where he succeeds at everything. Where Dickhead Dave does actually succeed is at abject failure. I'll give him credit for that. Doc Savage is, thankfully, no Dickhead Dave. He's a scientist, a genius, adventurer, do-gooder, and has a gold pass at both the tanning salon and the gym. Doc is on retreat at his arctic igloo, where his senses tell him something is wrong. He returns to New York to be told of his father's death in the fictitious South American country of Hidalgo, not the state in Mexico. I tried to holiday in the fictitious Hidalgo last year and can confirm that it is in fact a totally made up place, which, let me tell you, was quite embarrassing at the airport. Something's wrong. But how did you know? I sensed it. Picked up your thought waves, came as fast as I could. In his New York apartment on the 86th floor of the Empire State Building, Doc meets with his five army buddies, the Fabulous Five, each of whom is a leader in their chosen field. Monk is a chemist, Ham is a lawyer, Rennie a construction engineer, Johnny is an archaeologist, and Long Tom is an electrical genius. These characters are true to the books. Monk likes his pig, Ham bullies Monk, Johnny talks like somebody you'd hate to engage in small talk, etc. But really, the Fabulous Five feel like they should make a more positive contribution to this film. Occasionally, one of them will help move the plot along, but if you cut them out of the film completely, you might not even notice. Hey, fellas, look! I mean, this film is about Doc Savage first and foremost. Savage has received some documents from his father, but before he can inspect them, an assassin tries to take out Savage. His crew spring into action, tackling their assailant, who they discover is a member of an unknown South American tribe. This is my problem. 
But, Doc, remember when we were all buddies fighting in the trenches? If we ever got out alive, we help each other in peace, as we did in war. Savage and co. leave for Hidalgo, but first manage to foil another assassination attempt with the remote control decoy plane. Actually, that robot airplane was only made of fabric and plywood. Once on the ground, they find they're obstructed by local government official Goro, whose office has apparently lost the deeds to some land given to Savage Senior by a mysterious tribe. Goro is in league with Captain Seas, a rhinestone-bedecked salty sea dog also looking for the mysterious tribe. Seas is also possibly the inventor of the Bedazzler. After an attempt on Savage's life by mystical animated poison snakes, Savage and company are invited to dine on Seas' boat, where things take a turn. Thanks to gadgets like this laser and the Fabulous Five each being equipped with miniature rebreathers, they're able to escape. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Savage determines he must find the tribe that his father had visited and sets off on an expedition, guided by Mona, a woman from Goro's office who's also conveniently from a remote village that tells of a legendary lost tribe. I mean, hooray, I'm from a legendary lost tribe and you don't hear me going on about it. Mona has fallen in love with Savage, but he can't let anybody love him since they'd always be in danger. I love you. For your own safety, I think it's best you remain here. Which, when you think about it, is the fourth best way to end a relationship after a revelation of a herpes diagnosis, offering to split the bill at Burger King, or suggesting that you watch together the first season of a Netflix original that's already been cancelled. Mona, you're a prick. After some travelling montages, we'll arrive at the tribe's village, which just happens to have naturally occurring pools of molten gold. Unfortunately, Seas and his men, along with Goro, have gotten there first. The Fabulous Five are captured, as is Mona, and they're locked in a cave with some more deadly animated snakes. Doc Savage does what he normally does and overpowers everyone, freeing his friends, giving them the anti venine and then takes on Seas in a multi-discipline martial arts battle. Goro's misadventures with dynamite precipitate an eruption which turns him into a statue, while Savage returns home with Seas and performs a brain acupuncture to cure him of his evil tendencies. You'll leave the center completely well and become a respectable member of society. And then it's time for Doc Savage and company to rest until their next big screen advent. Uh, no, that's it. Doc Savage is almost a good film in places, but also not too far off being a not especially great one. I love me some absurd comedy, so the tone of the film appeals to me on paper. However, it's the execution that falls flat much of the time. Flatter than a flat earth is misunderstanding of how GPS works. George Powell, producer of some classic science fiction films like War of the Worlds, When Worlds Collide and The Time Machine, wasn't able to muster up a script that would enchant moviegoers the way the books had enthralled readers. Doc Savage, Man of Bronze is a meal at a top restaurant with two Michelin stars, where the kitchen staff are just having a really bad day. The used band-aid you found in your soup is just a foretaste of things to come. And what's worse, Gordon Ramsay is setting up with a film crew. At the time, Ron Ely was best known for playing Tarzan in the late 60s television series. So best known, in fact, that he was pretty much typecast as athletic hero types. Doc Savage didn't do much to change that perception. Ely as Doc Savage is easily the best part of the film, one of the few cast members who seems at ease in the movie. I mean, all he really has to do is look heroic, which he does and does very well. Let us remember our code. Let us strive every moment of our lives to make ourselves better and better to the best of our ability. The Fabulous Five, on the other hand, do not make much of a positive impression, even if many of them are familiar from other roles. William Lucking guested in practically everything for decades, and Paul Gleason would be a go-to actor whenever you needed somebody to play an antagonist, if not always an outright villain. But here the five are mostly forgettable, without much spark. That 30s style dialogue wasn't particularly 30s style apart from a few catchphrases cribbed from the books. So to compensate, we'll use our new audio plugin, 30s Guy, which turns any voiceover into an authentic character from the 1930s. Doc Savage, Man of Bronze, was an early role for Pamela Hensley, who would be a semi-familiar face on television in the late 70s. She's got Muxie, and she's got Spunk. I've made so many voyages to all corners of the world that I adopted the name Seas. S-E-A. 
Yes. Bo Wexler wasn't an especially well-known actor, but he was one of the few who could match Ely's height. He does manage to find the right level of archness in the role. Seize is almost an evil mirror of Savage. Bob Corso as the greedy Goro is probably the next most interesting character after Savage and Seize. In a scene that's either a symptom of everything wrong with the film, or a sign they were almost on the right track, Goro sleeps in a giant rocking crib. Outrageous. Okay, that's enough of that. Some of the cast work well enough in the film, but I don't really buy the Fabulous Five as being a particularly tight unit. They get most of the least entertaining scenes and some pretty ordinary dialogue. Savage remains rather aloof towards his circle of friends. They will do almost anything for him, and yet he interacts with them as a group rather than as individuals. Simply dummies. For example, Uncle Eric used to have a circle of friends who were all die-hard mountaineers, but then they all died hard. Yes, it feels like somebody saw Batman with Adam West and decided that a tongue-in-cheek approach was best. Some fans decried the film as camp with all of its silliness. Absurd is probably more accurate. Savage's dialogue is the closest we come to authentic sounding corniness delivered earnestly by Ely, in which case it works. The Fabulous Five on the other hand, oh, every time the camera lingers on their banter, I can feel the will to carry on draining. Everything all right? Uh, uh, I think it's time for 30s guy again. The dialogue isn't particularly snappy much of the time. There aren't too many memorable or quotable lines in the film. It's not all bad, just not enough of it is better than adequate. Pal had dreams of more Doc Savage films, but I can't get too down about this not becoming a franchise, and it had so much potential. Yeah, I think I'll just leave that switched off. We'll use the extinguisher gloves. The film has a lantern George star who could act. Interesting production values, even if most of it seems to be shot in Burbank. There is some atmospheric visuals during the trek to find the village, and cool looking animated poison snakes. Something's wrong. It also has an alarming overuse of zoom lenses, like you ask the random tourist at Disneyland to hold your video camera for a minute so you could get a shot of your family together. This film is produced with lofty goals, goals felled by a budget crunch during production, exemplified by a planned custom score replaced with public domain tunes by John Philip Sousa, which are given new lyrics to hype up the film's protagonist. It's a sort of comedy played straight by the actors, with the idea that the audience would enjoy this movie assuming they were in on the gag. Look, having read many comments on our videos, I can understand why program makers on television would add canned laughter to sitcoms. Perhaps Man of Bronze would have played better in theatres with this. One thing for sure, he ain't no native New York. The word is, isn't. He isn't, ain't. What's the difference? If I was a Doc Savage book fan, I'd probably hate this film for its wildly inconsistent comedic leanings. At the same time, as a comedy fan who appreciates absurdity, this is also too slight for me. The constant tug of war between the serious and the silly is one where both teams would lose, falling on their butts. I do like the use of Sousa's music extolling the virtues of Doc Savage and occasionally narrating the film. But if you just wanted to see Doc Savage do his thing as he does in the books, this was probably not the film for you. Doc Savage isn't played for comedy, but it seems to have been written as one. It has a few funny bits here and there, but much of the time the humour is stamped on by the film's pacing. It's a short film that either needed to be shorter or better edited, but either way it either needed to be funnier or double down on the adventure aspects. There's a short chase in New York with interminable scenes of the Fabulous Five, a fight on a boat, and then a long drawn out travel montage where nothing much of anything happens, and then suddenly we're in a lagoon that looks like it was filmed in the producer's back garden. Doc Savage as a larger than life character feels like it needs something a little grander than this movie which is only slightly larger in scale than a television movie of the day. The film was not well received at the time of release and also did not do that well financially, putting paid to George Powell's vision of a series of films starring the character. Very good. <laughs> No. Reviews at the time of release were like sticking chili infused band aids on a paper cut, not particularly pleasant. Was the camp or absurdist tone the problem, or was it just not silly enough? Oh, and it also opened at the same time as some film about a fish. He didn't say he liked it, he said he saw it. George Powell had a script for a second film written, and had also hoped to turn the property into a television series at the time, but all for naught. Man of Bronze did poorly at the box office, the sort of lacklustre performance you only get when trying to mow your lawn with an electric toothbrush. Also, I now realise too late where I went wrong in the garden this morning. Sure, the film has its fans. I know I used to love this movie when it was on television in the afternoons as a kid, but in more recent times the film's flaws really do prevent me from absolutely loving this film. I don't hate the movie, 
but it's one of those ones that isn't as good as you remembered it, which I guess is about 80% of the content on this channel. If you take exception to somebody reviewing something that you liked when you were, say, I don't know, eight or nine or 10, I really would recommend you take another look as an adult. Doc Savage is one of those where the memory from decades ago is beaten to a bloody pulp by watching it in the present. By the nature aroused, seeking revenge. Doc Savage Man of Bronze was a good idea that didn't quite gel together into the fun, tongue-in-cheek adventure film it wanted to be. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below or check out some of our other videos. This is Clark Savage Jr. I am not currently available.